Broadcast continues from the Grand Parade here in Cape Town, and I'm joined now by veteran journalist uh, Pippa Green uh, to reflect on the life and times of the late uh, Archbishop Desmond uh, Tutu. Pippa, thank you for your time, um, you know, speaking under such difficult circumstances. Um, I want to start off with a broad reflection from you. You've been a journalist for many, many years. Uh, the early 80s uh, is, is, is as far back as I can trace your career. So you would have been in the thick of things uh, when the Arch became the Archbishop of Cape Town, moved to Cape Town, and then the events subsequent to that. And I think we will touch on a few of those events. But I'd rather, I think I want to start with your description of the late Arch, uh, which you gave some time ago to uh, Glenn Frankel of the Washington Post. Um, where you said, quote, uh, the Archbishop's energy, the power that beams from him, his voice, his charisma, makes thousands upon thousands of people obey him blindly. And when he speaks, he speaks for all, yet he utters the most secret sorrow of your heart. Does that sum up the Archbishop you knew? Look, I... In some ways, it, it definitely does. I think as well, I should add that for a short time through John Allen, his spokesperson in 89, when I returned from the United States, I actually worked for him editing his newsletter, not full time, but one or two days a week while I, was, while I had a small baby. And that was an amazing experience because I saw a side of him that you didn't see in public. I saw that very quiet and prayerful side. And what strikes me about him, struck me about him, is two things. A, that he was much more, um, it sounds odd to say of an archbishop, but profoundly religious than I understood, a kind of high Anglican church. It was terrifying to go into the chapel with him because he, there were these, some of the rituals I didn't really know, even having been brought up in the church. But he was deeply spiritual, deeply prayerful. At the same time, he was also, I think, probably one of South Africa's best strategists. So he, he kind of understood the political terrain. And, in, and his big intervention in the mid-80s was over sanctions. So that when the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act, the CAAA, was passed in America, despite Reagan's veto twice, not once but twice, it was overruled. Tutti played an incredible role in that. That was 1986. And after that, you know, there was the, the financial pressure on the apartheid government got so profound and so severe that it was that then change began to happen. But I think that his, his thinking about what needed to happen was really, has really not been credited enough. And Pippa, that whole, um, the credit that you give him for the campaign, that you duly give him for the campaign for sanctions against apartheid South Africa, it can't have been easy because it wasn't universally accepted that this was no. one of the strategies to go, right? Did you pick that up? It, well, it was, I was in the States for some of that time, so I saw it from that side. But, but number one, it was illegal here. It was actually illegal to call and campaign for sanctions here. So although the ANC was doing it in exile, he took quite a big risk doing it here. And he also risked his own congregation. So the congregation was, it was mixed. I mean, there were quite a lot of white people, but a lot of black people as well. And I think it was when that famous graffiti appeared on a bishop's court wall. I was an Anglican until I put two and two together. So he was, so he was really kind of um, pilloried by some of his own congregation. And it was hard work keeping that together, which he, he did in the end quite successfully. Yeah. Let's talk about then the big moments in history, Pippa, because part of your work has been uh, to record history, at, at least in the first draft uh, format of it all, where we are at the Grand Parade. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's, it's, there's going to be this memorial service that will be taking place a bit later on at the City Hall, but it's also a very historic venue uh, in the journey of the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Just from your um, observational point of view, uh, perhaps one step behind mm. Tutu, if I can put it that way, what are some of the iconic moments that played themselves out uh, during your reporting career? Um, because also that was your focus as well, following the anti-apartheid um, movement as well as uh, issues of labor. 
Well, I mean, clearly Nelson Mandela was released here. Those steps behind us are yeah. the first place that he addressed and the Archbishop was with him. But I think to us more important than that was the run, to what changed things. And for me, the, the march that changed things was September 1989, 13th of September 1989. There'd been an enormous amount of violence in Cape Town. It was the time when the purple water cannons were, were sprayed at protesters. Uh, the Archbishop was really in the middle of that, counselling protesters, putting himself between the police and, 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 and protesters. There were political funerals where there was a lot of anger and, and things were looked as though at that stage, really and at that stage they could go either way. And then the last white elections happened. I think it was the 6th of September. And there was a lot of violence in the, in the townships. And I think 20 people were killed. And he was really, he was really upset about that. He, he just retreated into his chapel for a day and began to, I think he went into prayer. He said to his then chaplain, Matt Esau, um, I'm going to think about what to do. And he came out and he said, we must have a peace march. And everyone, the UDF leaders at the time and Matt Esau, everyone blanched. They said, but Father, we're going to look what the police, how, look how the police have treated us. We're going, to get, we're going to get killed. We're going to get slaughtered. And he said, no, God has told me. He told me this afterwards. God has told me and I'm afraid, well, I think John Allen, and I can't argue with God. So that was the time just before, a week before de Klerk took over. Mm -hmm. There'd also been more international pressure because the Americans then um, had threatened to ask the European governments to impose stricter sanctions. So that march went ahead. De Klerk gave permission for it. The then Minister of Police begged him to apply for permission, magisterial permission, which he refused to do. And 30,000 people or more walked from St. George's Cathedral to here. Police lined the streets, but nobody, nobody did a thing. There was no violence. It took about two and a half, half hours to reach this site. And that was when he first used the phrase, the rainbow people of God. To, to the crowds. And that was really, I think, the tipping point. After yeah. that, everything changed. Yeah. And, and, and Pippa, it, it, just as a final, uh, as a parting shot then, um, we grapple with legacy in this country. And, and, and that perhaps it's not unique uh, to our country. Once someone has passed on, um, you suddenly get a pulling in different directions in terms of interpreting the person's legacy. And I suppose for me, the, the challenge is for us to agree on a set of facts, as Mac Maharaj yeah. said uh, all those years ago, mm -hmm. to say, let's agree on the facts and disagree mm -hmm. on the interpretation of yeah. the facts. When you reflect the Desmond Tutu that you knew, and some of the debates that you see at the moment after his passing. Mm. How do you reconcile that in your mind? Mm. What's the conversation we are missing uh, about legacy? That imperfect as it is, uh, but it's based on objective facts. Yes, precisely. And I've been shocked to see some of the stuff I have seen on social media, particularly about the, his legacy in the Truth Commission and Winnie Madikizela Mandela. I was at that hearing. And there was nothing could be further from the truth that he, he kind of condemned her. In fact, he said how much he respected her, how much he asked her to, he gave her paths to come out. In fact, in that hearing, Abu Bakr Asfat, who was the brother of the doctor who was killed in the, in the, in the clinic in Soweto where Albertina Sisulu worked, gave evidence, broke down and wept. The father of a boy who disappeared at the hands of that football club also came and the, the, I believe that he's, he's recently been discovered, the body, but he was killed as well. There were human rights violations and I think that the Archbishop really tried to find a path for, for Winnie Mandela and for the football club. So what is being said on social media mm. is really not true. He gave, he gave um, F.W. de Klerk as hard, if not a harder time at the Truth Commission. Yeah. All right, Pippa, thank you so much for your reflections and, um, you know, sharing some of your memories as well with us here on ENCA. That's veteran journalist Pippa Green Day reflecting on the life of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu.